PZ, thank you, and uh, welcome. Well, hello. Let me see if I can get technology to work. So I'll see if this is all going to do something. How do I know if it's going to work? I don't know. Have faith. Okay, there's something. Yes, you're reading my email. I better get that off of here real quick. Okay. Yes, it works because it's all black, like my soul. Okay, so I was really happy to be invited to speak here, and there's a good reason for that, and that is that I used to live here once upon a time. Yeah, late 80s, early 90s, before many of you were born. It's been that long. Before the Olympics completely transformed everything downtown. Yeah, I, went, I was a postdoc at the University of Utah, so I was here. And one of the things we really liked about Utah was this happened to be the time when I was raising my children. So I have, I have three kids. One of them was born here in Salt Lake City. And we really liked it here. This is a fabulous city to raise kids in. It's one of the best places in the country for families. At least, that is, if you're white and not gay and willing to be quiet about criticizing religion. So there's, there are some drawbacks to living here. But it was great otherwise. Uh, the city has some fabulous parks. I recommend them. There's my kids playing at Liberty Park. And there was another park up on the hill they were at. Uh, but the other things we really liked here was the desert. Uh, this is a great place for desert hikes. One of our favorite places was Stansbury Island, which is the big rocky place in the middle of the Great Salt Lake. You can reach it by a causeway. And we spent a lot of time there exploring. There's my kids rummaging around. Con looks very excited about something. He probably found a lizard or something. Uh, the place was full of lizards, great things like scorpions. Really, I highly recommend exploring the beautiful desert southwest. It's gorgeous. And among the things we, they were very excited to see when we were living here were, were of course, things like the, the schools of manatees that live in the Great Salt Lake. <laughs> and of course, if you're lucky, you can find uh, the great herds of diplodocids crossing the salt flats. Why are you laughing? <laughs> it's like you don't believe me. Why don't you believe me? Well, I can think of a few reasons, okay. You know, you know I would say, you've got to go try and find them. Get, get in your cars, go take a tour, head out west and go looking out there. Um, you know, you may not see them, but that's just because sometimes they're not out. Uh, it really helps to take lots of drugs before you go looking for them. <laughs> But what you might be thinking is, hey, this is the first I've ever heard of dinosaurs living in Utah. You know, there's lots of dead ones here, but you've never actually seen these things walking around out there, so you may be a little doubtful. And that's because there's a perfectly good line of evidence that says you shouldn't believe me, and that's a kind of negative evidence. I know Eddie talked about this just a moment ago, too, that the absence of evidence really is evidence of absence. That because we don't have clear evidence of these things, that, that you don't have people going out there and taking pictures of these things. You know, you can obviously tell I just made these up. Uh, you don't have police reports of squashed cars out on I-80. You know, there's a lot of reasons to find this extremely doubtful. And that's perfectly fair, like I said. And like Eddie also said, absence of evidence is evidence of absence. I also have to have a little aside here because you will often hear Carl Sagan cited to the opposite. Let me just mention this so that it's all clear to everyone. If you read The Demon Haunted World, what you actually find is that Carl Sagan says the opposite. He's criticizing the claim that absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Of course it's, it's evidence. It's not proof but it can be good evidence, especially when it's accompanied by evidence that you've actually looked, that you've gone searching for these sorts of things. But I want to emphasize as well that there's another way to approach this, and that is 
to take the approach of looking for positive evidence, positive evidence of disproof. And it's the same thing when we're dealing with religion. I mean, I indulge in this myself. It's really easy to look at religion and point and laugh and say, that's incredible, that's absurd. Why should you believe that when you haven't got anything but your silly book, the Bible, that's full of nonsense? And we laugh. And that's, again, looking at the absence of sound evidence behind their beliefs. But we should also be looking for positive evidence, evidence that contradicts the claims. In the case of, of my claim that there are manatees and dinosaurs in Utah, you know, we can describe positive evidence. You know, we know, for instance, that manatees eat sea grasses. They are not present in the Great Salt Lake. Yeah, go take the tour and look, you will not find exotic seagrasses growing there. In fact, you'll discover that the Great Salt Lake actually kind of stinks and it's really unpleasant. Um, but also, we also know something about physiology. We'd say, but manatees can't live in that level of salinity. They die in a hypersaline environment. Their kidneys are not equipped to cope with that de degree of saltiness. So we'd say right out there that, you know, I have good positive evidence that physiologically and ecologically you will not find manatees living in the Great Salt Lake. Same thing with the t story about dinosaurs. We know they've been extinct for 60 million years. 60 million years, it turns out, is a really long time. <laughs> and it's highly unlikely that anything would persist that long. In addition, something, you know, if there is a lineage that pers persists that long, we know that populations cannot exist unchanged for 60 million years. We also know something about the physiology of dinosaurs. Diplodocus, for instance, lived by eating conifer needles. You're not going to find those out on the salt flats. So it'd be really ridiculous to imagine, even if by some miracle they survived for that long, that they could survive there. So there's positive evidence for rejecting many of these claims, and we should recognize that. Now, this is the title of my talk, and really what it is, it's, I'm, I'm just going to give you a few hints here that uh, I'm currently working on a new book, and the, the book is about the science of purposelessness. That as atheists, we have said this many times, that there is no cosmic purpose, there's no teleology, there is nothing that says, here's way, the way you're supposed to live your life. There is no God out there telling you how to do it. And one reason we can say that is, of course, the negative evidence. There certainly is no evidence anywhere in the scientific record anywhere in the body of evidence that we have, again, as, as Eddie, Eddie was pointing out earlier, where we can actually say, here's direct event, evidence of a supernatural event. It just doesn't exist. So why should we believe it? But further, I want to explain to you that there is actually scientific evidence against the whole idea of any kind of guiding purpose in the universe. And as a biologist, of course, I'm, I'm not going to focus on the big things like the Big Bang and so forth. I'm going to focus on evolution and biology. And when you look at the evolutionary history of all kinds of organisms, what you find is that what drives them are natural events. And those natural events are primarily chance and natural selection. And I'm sorry to say there is no room in the story for a divine finger diddling with people's genomes. Okay, it just didn't happen. That what we have instead is a body of positive explanations for how we did evolve. Now, as I said, I can only give you the briefest summary of, of some of these scientific experiments. For some reason, American atheists only gave me half an hour when they should have given me two or three hours. Then we could, we could get somewhere. But I'll try to keep to my time. Uh, what kind of evidence is there that there's no purpose? Well, here's one piece of evidence. Uh, this is the bacteriophage T1, and I know you should be just looking at that and saying the horror of that creature says there is no God. <laughs> it is. It's, it's a virus. What it is, that capsule up there contains some DNA, and the rest of it is a big injection apparatus. It lands on cells, and it squirts DNA, and, and it takes over the cell's machinery and eventually it causes the cell to explode and die. It's really horrible. Uh, fortunately for us, this is the one piece where you can breathe a sigh of relief, this creature exists in multitudes on the planet, uh, but it only attacks bacteria. It doesn't find us particularly tasty. There are other things that do. We could talk about the Ebola virus, for instance, but this is, this is the phage that eats bacteria. And there's been a lot of scientific research done on this animal. Uh, no, I shouldn't call it an animal, organism. 
No, it's a virus. I can't even call it an organism. This thing, this horrible thing. <laughs> this little piece of chemistry. Why we've done a lot of research on it is it's easy. There's lots of bacteria. We can grow bacteria in massive swarms of billions and trillions. Uh, we can grow these things in billions and trillions. It makes it really easy to do sophisticated genetics and evolutionary genetics by looking at this thing. Now, of course, the way we do this isn't, isn't by actually looking at the creature itself, the organism, the thing. What we have to do is an indirect set of observations. And what we do is we take advantage of a property of this, of this virus that we can culture it on a dish. So what this is is a Petri dish. And this Petri dish has been coated with a lawn of bacteria, something like E. coli, whatever. We just got this whole sheet of bacteria growing there. And then what we do is we cover it with a couple of speckles of the bacteriophage T1. And what it does is it injects itself into the bacterium. It causes it to explode, spreading more viruses around, which infects adjacent bacteria, which then explode and send them all around. So what you get is these clear spots. You see each of those little dots in the Petri dish? What those represent are scenes of unimaginable horror to a bacterium. That's where the bacterial colony has been exterminated by this plague of viruses. Kind of cool, huh? Yeah, we, scientists just love scenes of horror like this. We can just do these, these amazing genetics with these devastating effects. So this is what's going on, is that you, you infect them with this, this virus, the virus kills them, they explode, you get these clear spots, you can easily count them. Now the interesting thing is that this is dependent a little bit on genetics. One of the things we also discover is that sometimes there are bacteria that are resistant that they can actually resist the effects of the T1 bacteriophage. So you culture these bacteria on a plate, you put the phage on there, the phage are, uh, absolutely do nothing. They can't kill anything. The bacteria continue to thrive, which is what led to this experiment. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about this one experiment, again, because Dave didn't give me three hours to talk at you, but we can, we can talk about this a little bit. I'm sure this is all familiar to all of you, right? The, the famous Luria Delbruck experiment, which was published in 1943, and you should all have it memorized, so I'm just going to give you a cursory explanation. Um, the Luria Delbruck experiment was a key experiment in the history of genetics. Because what they were asking was a fundamental question, and that is they knew something about mutations. They knew that, that there are changes in the genetic material. They didn't know what the genetic material was, but they knew that there were changes in it that could change the activity of, of the creatures that, that expressed it. The question was, and again, this is a very fundamental question, is what causes that? We're asking a question about cause. Are these mutational changes caused directly by activity in the environment? That is, is there something in the environment that possibly induces resistance to T1, for instance? Is it exposure to T1? So the bacteria learn, they acquire this ability because they've seen what T1 does. You know, imagine the walking dead, and the, you, you can imagine yourself in that situation where you would learn from experience and you'd learn to shoot them in the head and whatever. Is that what's going on here? Or alternatively, is there no relationship between the acquisition of a mutation and the cause, the resistance that you do experience? And they took advantage of this prolific virus, these prolific bacteria, to do an experiment that involved billions of organisms. Again, that's the power of this, is that you can use so many organisms, you can get a very good answer from this. Uh, they start off with two hypotheses, and one is, well, yeah, maybe what it is is the presence of T1 induces, causes a response in the bacteria, so they become resistant. And that's what's shown in the top line up there. Uh, you've got this colony of bacteria. They're all dividing, dividing. That's what the tree is all about. You see these colonies dividing. Uh, and then you expose them to the, to the phage, which is that brown line right there. You hit them with a nice layer of, of the virus. And then what you'd expect is, well, then maybe in every Petri dish where you do this, you'd see some of the cells acquire resistance in response to that stimulus. So that's one hypothesis, that resistance is a physiological response to the phage virus. The other hypothesis is shown in the second line. And this is what we say is that resistance is 
due entirely to random mutation. In this case, what you postulate is, well, you got these colonies of bacteria, they're growing, they're dividing, and at random points in small numbers of the, uh, the bacteria, they acquire a mutation that does nothing for them at that point, but may later provide resistance. So that's what you see up there in the second line, that at different stages, so for instance, if you look at number one over there way on the left, you've got a, a mutation that arises just before they played it in the presence of the virus, and in number two, no cell has acquired this magic mutation. In plate three, it arose early in the colony, and many of its descendants have it, so you have large numbers of bacteria that are resistant to the phage. And then what you do is you do the simple test. You raise lots of little test tubes full of bacteria. That's the bottom line down there. You just let them grow for a good long time, and then you plate them on a dish that's covered with phage. Yes, it's like throwing them into the arena. They're going to face a horrible death if they don't have resistance. If it's because of a physiological response, and what you'd expect is that in every dish, you ought to see small but roughly equal numbers of bacteria that acquire resistance in, the, in response to the same stimulus. If it's because of pure random chance, what you ought to see is a huge amount of variability. Sometimes the colony will have acquired it early and lots of the bacteria will be resistant and others, none of them will have acquired it and they'll die. And that's exactly what you see. So the bottom line is actually showing the actual results. What you get is this huge amount of variability where a certain number of plates will have no, back, no, uh, no resistance, others will have lots of resistance. You can use this mathematically, again, because we're dealing with large numbers, we're talking billions and billions of individuals, you can analyze this mathematically and determine things like mutation rate and so forth, and you can actually calculate when these kinds of events happen. And what you discover is that, yes, it is pure random chance, that mathematically it can be demonstrated that, no, there's, there's no guiding response, there's no magic response, God does not favor a particular petri dish over another, that the results are actually totally explainable by natural events involving chance acquisition of mutations. Now, of course, what you're saying is, you know, if you're, if you're a good religious person, you're saying, well, so what? It's bacteria. God does not care about bacteria. God cares about his chosen people, the Mormons or whoever. So maybe what you'd expect instead is this doesn't apply. We should look at people. And we have looked at people. Maybe not in so many numbers, and we can't do this controlled experiment, although the mad scientists and all cries out, yes, we should try this. No, we will not do this. That would be unethical. But it has been done, and I'll just point you at this slide. Uh, many of you have heard of the uh, great flu pandemic of 1918, in which roughly 30 to 50 million people worldwide died of the flu. And what you see in this particular map is this is a picture of a very odd-shaped Petri dish that has been coated with a lawn of people. And then what has happened is this virus, this flu virus, has appeared in this population in scattered places. And what you see is holes appearing at scattered places, which is just like we saw those plaques in the bacterial plates. And what we see over and over again is the same phenomenon, that I'm sorry your prayers, your good wishes, your will to live are not going to allow you to survive the zombie outbreak or the Ebola outbreak or a new flu virus. What's going to save you is chance events like where you are. Are you isolated from people who are transmitting the disease? What particular attributes do you carry in your genes? Do you carry a resistance to this particular flu virus? Because that also happens. Or are you susceptible to it? It's all a bunch of things that you cannot control. In other words, we're kind of doomed. What you've got is what you've got. And it may lead to your death. It may lead to your survival but it's not a matter of will whether that will happen. Have I just oppressed everyone? <laughs> okay. That's my goal is, yes, we will, we will break everyone's heart. There's another place where we can see this playing out in people as well, and that is in our evolutionary history. So here's something that's very well established. This is, this is the lineage of the great apes, 
and you can see the relationships of the different species there. Uh, the lovely smiling woman up there at the top, that happens to be a human being, whereas the lovely smiling person in the second one happens to be a chimpanzee. And we can actually map out the evolutionary distance between these. So as you see, there's some little numbers there. It says, for instance, that, that branch point from the last common ancestor of chimpanzees and humans was about 5.4 million years ago. We can figure these things out. Isn't it amazing? That's quite a bit more than 6,000 years ago, too, by the way. <laughs> so we can work these things out. The other thing we can do is we can look at the differences between humans and chimpanzees. And we have fully sequenced the chimpanzee gen genome, the human genome, and we have done direct comparisons. And the results of those comparisons is that there are approximately 20 to 30 million nucleotide differences between humans and chimpanzees. Sounds like a lot, right? 20 to 30 million nucleotide differences. But then you've got to start thinking, wait a minute, how big is the genome? The genome is 3 billion bases. This is a tiny fraction of the total genome that's different between us. In fact, when you go through and compare in detail, you discover that of the proteins that are produced by chimpanzees and humans, roughly 30% of them are completely identical. They have no differences at all. The sequence is the same in every detail. Further, when you do find those that are, those that are different, the average dis difference between proteins and humans and chimpanzees, between the genes coding for proteins, is roughly two nucleotides. And the average gene is roughly 1,000 nucleotides. So you can tell uh, these are small, insignificant differences between us. Of course, some of them must be significant. I mean, because there are obvious differences here. So there's 20 to 30 million differences, but there's a lot of similarities as well. Uh, that big colorful thing up there, it's, it's one of my favorite things, is to look at genetic centene. Uh, that's a centene map. Centene maps are a lot of fun to do. What you do in this case is it's like a paint by number set. So you take your chimpanzee genome and you look at all the genes, for instance, on chromosome one. And you say, we're going to color all those genes brown, so we're going to paint them all brown. And then what we're going to do is we're going to go to the human genome and we're going to find all the genes that match the ones on the chimpanzee, wherever they are, and paint them brown. And the surprising thing when you do that is, like you see at the top, they're all in the same place. All the chimpanzee genes on chromosome one of the chimpanzee, almost, there's a few differences, uh, almost all of them are in the same place in us in chromosome one. Same with chromosome two, three, four, et cetera that when you actually do the mapping, you discover that the arrangement of our genes, the sequence of our genes, is very, very similar, which is kind of impressive. It says, yeah, we're, we're related to chimpanzees pretty clearly, and also to orangutans and gorillas and all these other lovely creatures. Now, one of the interesting things about this observation, again, it's math. We can measure these things. We can count them. We plug it into a computer and it tells us, oh, you're, you're different at this, roughly this many nucleotides. What we then do is we look at evolutionary theory. Evolutionary theory predicts how many mutations we ought to accumulate in this roughly almost six million years that separate us from the last common ancestor of chimpanzees. And that's going to be deter determined by the mutation rate and the fixation rate. We fix roughly 100 new mutations in the human population every generation, and this was six million years ago. We add these all up, we calculate, and what we discover to our surprise is that it predicts a few tens of millions of nucleotide differences based on chance and random drift alone. Almost all the nucleotide differences between us and chimpanzees are fully accounted for by drift, by chance. Now, of course, don't let me discount one thing, that is natural selection does play a role. At the same time we say that most of these differences are simply due to chance, we've also got a small subset that we know are, de are due to negative selection, that they've actually been, select changes have been selected against to prevent negative mutations from accumulating, and a smaller subset still are the result of positive selection. There actually have been positive selection events to make us different from chimpanzees. But the vast majority of it is due entirely to chance events. Now, do you find that discouraging? Do you find that kind of nihilistic, that what we find is positive evidence, that there are forces that have produced us and they're not 
divine favor. They're not the guidance of a god. They're not magic or supernatural. It's entirely natural, and it's been a ping pong ball dance of all kinds of different mutations over time. That's just the reality of it. We have to accept that. Now, what does that mean for us? You know, you're, here you are, you're saying, well, okay, there's no purpose to my existence. The cosmos does not give a good goddamn about me or us. We just happen to be here. So, should we stop? And the answer is no. That there are actually very good positive things to conclude from this. We are not under the thumb of a cosmic tyrant, which I find extremely pleasant to think about. <laughs> Good news all around right there. Uh, but also, we can also say, well, what does science tell us about our purpose and existence? And for this, I have to refer to one of my favorite biologists of all time, Peter Kropotkin, who loved it, lived at roughly the same time as Darwin in the era of magnificent beards. <laughs> you got to admire the guy just for that, right? Um, Peter Kropotkin's whole thesis was that there is a purpose to our existence. And in evolutionary sense, it's to ensure the maintenance and further development of the species. That's why we're here on this planet. That's why we've been here. This is the way natural selection works, is if we stop caring, we'll stop existing. And there will be no future generations to sit around and worry about what is an atheist going to do with his life, because we'll all be gone. So this is sort of a scientifically dictated after the fact goal that we have to care about maintenance and further development of the species. Further, Kropotkin's main claim to fame is he argued very strongly that our main purpose is not the struggle for existence. It is not competition. It is not to fight against one another. Our purpose in life is to be sociable to get along with each other and work and cooperate together. Because as he says here, that's you know, how you're most likely to survive, if you get along with your fellow human beings or fellow members of your species and work together. And further, that in addition to ensuring the, the survival and, and development of the species, we also want to increase the greatest amount of welfare and enjoyment of life for the individual. So I'm telling you right here, this is what biology tells me, is we do have a purpose. It's not to serve Rick Warren's God or any other God. Our purpose is to work together, cooperative, in a co cooperative way for the greatest welfare and enjoyment of life for every single one of us human beings. And that's how we progress. Okay.